Yes. There you go. These here are your tickets. Just listen for the cowbell. We do a lot of crazy different things here with uh, uh, Ben and Jerry to uh, follow after. So uh, it's just, you know, real laid back to produce the best, you know, product that we can with the ice cream, but also have fun doing it. Uh, I'm just tired to eat ice cream. If the purpose of business is, is not to make a lot of money, the whole reason that business exists and the economy exists is to serve the needs of people. The small scenic town of Waterbury, Vermont seems an unlikely place for a company which produces what Time Magazine considers to be the best ice cream in the world. Ben & Jerry's homemade ice cream is rapidly becoming a worldwide venture. Its sales are constantly increasing across the country, and their ice cream is just now being introduced to Moscow. One might think that the success of Ben & Jerry's is the result of innovative business minds. Surprisingly, neither Ben Cohen nor Jerry Greenfield had any business knowledge when they created Ben & Jerry's, so they were forced to rely on innovation alone. Ben had been a potter in the Adirondacks, and Jerry was struggling through medical school. In 1978, the two eager entrepreneurs set up their first scoop shop in a Burlington, Vermont gas station. The quality of their all-natural product brought them vast popularity and business prosperity. But their success story is more intriguing when you look at how Ben and Jerry define the word success. Their attitude toward business is not shaped by profit, but rather by having fun and sharing their good fortune with the community. This unorthodox belief, combined with their modest beginnings, are what have escalated not only their product, but their appeal. Ben and I met in seventh grade in junior high school when we were in the same gym class together and we were the two slowest, chubbiest guys in the class running around the track and uh, we were kind of in this little pack behind the rest of the pack and uh, we were supposed to run the mile in under seven minutes and the coach would yell at us, gentlemen, if you don't run the mile in under seven minutes, you're going to have to do it again. And Ben would yell back, gee coach, if I don't do it in under seven minutes the first time, I'm certainly not going to do it in under seven minutes the second time. And you know, loping along with Ben, I realized this is a guy I wanted to get to meet. His thinking was obviously way beyond what the coach was thinking, and uh, this is a guy that I wanted to hang out with. We've always liked to eat quite a bit, and when Ben and I thought about going into business, uh, it was just kind of natural that it would be in food, and we thought about bagels, and we actually checked into bagel making equipment and went to a used restaurant supply place uh, and found out that bagel making equipment would cost forty thousand dollars and we knew we didn't have forty thousand dollars we figured ice cream had to be cheaper so we picked homemade ice cream we actually went through a lot of different places uh... from long island before we ended up in vermont but mostly we wanted to live uh... in a more rural place uh... without nearly as many people and without the hustle and bustle and vermont is incredibly beautiful and not only that uh... it has great dairy products over their first 10 years of existence, Ben & Jerry's increased its business by 100% each year. The reason for this phenomenal success is clear to everyone involved in the company. It makes it a lot easier for us when you have what we call good people working underneath you. You know, I look at myself as being a resource provider for those people. I'm not the kind of manager that, you know, we just are looking over their shoulder all the time saying, you know, hey, you're not doing a good job. You know, we like to just let the people do their jobs, provide them with input and in how they can do it better, and then allow it to do that way and try to keep that flow of communication going down and the flow of communication coming back up. That's the big important thing here is that we have communication flow because that's the only way they can be successful.
You know, it's, it's hard to say it's just one thing because uh, it's been such a combination of factors. Uh, you know, you'd have to start with the quality of the ice cream. Uh, uh, no matter what we did, if people didn't like eating the ice cream, uh, our company never would have grown. And, you know, couple that with the kind of ice cream we make, uh, you know, this really rich, smooth, creamy ice cream with big chunks of cookies and candies uh, with a lot of texture variation and crunch and chunk. Creating original flavors is one of the trademarks of Ben & Jerry's. Taking chances on new flavors is part of their business. They come from a series of places. We get letters. Um, tourists send stuff in. Uh, we get people on tours, just give them to us. I get phone calls uh, probably once a week. Somebody will call up with a great idea. They want to sell it to us for a couple thou. And, uh, uh, we have a couple ideas come actually out of people who work here. Uh, once a year, I get a good idea. Um, and basically, we just take these ideas. A lot of them just come out of uh, eating in a restaurant. Uh, we throw ideas around in different meetings. The arrangement is if we can use this flavor and uh, put it into pints, uh, that they get a year's supply of that flavor. About four years ago, we received an anonymous postcard in the mail uh, from two deadheads in Maine who said, uh, hi, we're really uh, big Ben & Jerry's fans, we're big deadheads, and we think you ought to make a flavor called Cherry Garcia, because it would be a real hoot for the fans, and besides, dead paraphernalia always sells. And, you know, we thought this was a great idea, uh, and kind of thought about it for a long time. Uh, you know, Ben was kind of working on the flavor in his head, uh, but we couldn't really figure out what to do with it. And uh, we were out in San Francisco one day and ran into somebody who was... Uh, the editor of one of the Grateful Dead fan magazines, The Golden Road. And, uh, you know, we got to talking and we said, well, you know, we got this idea about Cherry Garcia. Do you think we ought to uh, get in touch with the dead and find out what they think about it? And she said, uh, well, why don't you let me have my people talk to the dead's people and we'll, uh, we'll see. So, uh, you know, we called her back the next week and she said, uh, it's okay, just go ahead and do it. And this was great, you know, all we wanted to hear. Uh, <laughs> no obstacles so uh, we went ahead and made this flavor uh, called cherry Garcia with dark sweet cherries and chocolate chunks and it was really good and we sent some out to cherry Garcia Jerry excuse me and uh, heard back from his wife saying they really liked it and whatever and uh, you know everything was really cool and then we ended up getting all this uh, national publicity about the flavor it was on MTV and VH1 and it was in USA Today and uh, you know, it was really kind of getting blown up, and then we heard from Jerry Garcia's lawyer, who said, uh, hi, uh, we hear you're making this flavor called uh, Cherry Garcia, and it's, uh, you know, it's an implied endorsement from Jerry Garcia, and, you know, you're really not allowed to do that. Uh, and we said, gee, uh, <laughs> uh, we don't want to do anything you guys don't want us to do. Uh, who wants to get into a hassle with the Grateful Dead? And, uh, you know, if you want us to stop, we'll stop. If you want us to do something else. And we ended up negotiating an agreement with them whereby we pay them a royalty, uh, most of which goes to the Rex Foundation, which is this nonprofit foundation that the Grateful Dead supports. And everybody's happy. And it's our number three selling flavor. Well, Chunky Monkey was an idea that was sent in by a young woman in New Hampshire, and she was working at a uh, school summer program um, at UNH for gifted kids. Uh, it was a musical program, and she was serving food on the line. And a bunch of kids, I guess, got their food, went back to their seats, and mixed up this whole mess of it in, in their bowl and came up and said, uh, we'd like some more Chunky Monkey. <laughs> she said, it looked like vomit, but uh, I thought the name was pretty good. And you could probably put bananas and, and nuts of some sort in. And uh, I thought it was a great idea, so I, I wrote it to you. And if you want to use it, feel free or something. And we basically, uh, we tried it with a number of different banana purees, uh, nuts, chocolate, uh, finally ended up with walnuts, um, a good banana puree that didn't taste too cooked or uh, too artificial, it, you know, pretty fresh tasting, which is pretty hard considering the fact that uh, you've got to take these bananas and process them to some extent to get them in there. And it turned out that she 
hates bananas and didn't even want to use the year's supply of Chunky Monkey that she had coming to her because she hated bananas so much. Tuskegee Chunk is uh, a feature flavor that we made uh, that was uh, a tribute to Tuskegee University and George Washington Carver, who we all know is the, uh, the father of the modern American peanut, or however you would like to say it. And, uh, you, know, it was, uh, you know, it's part of our way of trying to integrate, as I mentioned, uh, our social concerns with, uh, with our ice cream concerns and our monetary concerns. And, uh, you know, it was a way for us to come out with a feature flavor that uh, brings people attention to some of the contributions that people have made throughout history in this country uh, and also a way to help uh, fund Tuskegee Institute, which is uh, uh, the university that was founded by George Washington Carver uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama. My best flavor was uh, sugar plum and that like took off like a, a, <laughs> a can in the wrong direction and accelerate it quickly into oblivion. Basically, we were trying to come up with a flavor for Christmas. We'd had uh, Nutcracker Sweet, which is basically a reverse New York Super Fudge chunk, a vanilla base with the nuts and stuff. Uh, but we wanted to come up with something else, and Sugar Plum was the obvious thing. Uh, Nutcracker Sweet has the Sugar Plum Fairy. So we thought, well, Sugar Plum. OK, what's a Sugar Plum? And it turns out that a sugar plum is a, kind of a candied plum, somewhat on the lines of a candied cherry or a candied fruit that you might find in a fruit cake, which nobody's really that happy to eat. Most people get their fruit cakes and then sort of ship them down river. Um, so we didn't want to go with that idea. We thought we'd go with something else and basically thought plum is a good idea. How about if we put a caramel sauce into the plum ice cream? And uh, so that's the, that's the way that we went. And in theory, it's a good idea. And uh, it still had some pretty nice flavor you know, combinations. It was lacking a couple things. It was lacking chunks, which everyone obviously knows Ben and Jerry's is about chunks. If they've had one flavor, they, they look for the chunks. And uh, it didn't translate into the upscale version as well as a lot of them from the uh, research and development into the upscale there it, it lost something uh, the intensity of plum flavor didn't translate as well when you added um, the machinery to uh, you know to the process it, it kind of changed the intensity of plum so it tasted vaguely like weak cherry and uh, you lost that plum identity, which is important to a flavor. If you're going to call it sugar plum. We're just coming out with Ben & Jerry's Light, which is uh, a lower fat ice cream uh, that's still made to taste incredibly wonderful, as Ben & Jerry's always does. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was partly a response to uh, not only the public's desire, but my own and several people in the company personal desire to be eating products that are lower fat and less cholesterol and uh, uh, I think we've done it. I think we've come out with a great product in uh, really wonderful flavors. We have it in Heath Bar Crunch, uh, reverse chocolate chunk, uh, vanilla Swiss chocolate almond, coffee almond fudge. Uh, you know, I th we've got six flavors that are great and now uh, you have your choice. You can eat, you know, the incredibly wonderful Ben & Jerry's original or Ben and Jerry's light. I realize that most inventors probably invent uh, two, three, four, five hundred things before they ever have anything that really takes off. I mean, unless you're a, an Edison, you're not going to have a success ratio. And actually, I heard an interesting story about Edison that he was trying to, uh, around the time that uh, I heard about this, uh, I was dealing with my deflated ego that Edison was working on cement garden furniture and um, he needed it to be strong enough so that it wouldn't break, it wouldn't be brittle. So he'd, he'd take it up a couple feet and drop it while it would break. So he made it bigger and bigger and to, until when he dropped it, it broke, the, broke through the ground uh, or, you know, actually broke the cement floor. And there was no, you know, no area in between 
the furniture breaking and the floor breaking. And I thought, well, he lived through that and he invented some good stuff, you know. Sugar plum was kind of like cement lawn furniture. <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of new flavors, uh, I think we've got Rainforest Crunch coming out soon, which is uh, uh, a vanilla ice cream with Rainforest Crunch candy in it, which is a uh, nut brittle that's uh, made with Brazil nuts and cashews that are harvested in the rainforest. And uh, Rainforest Crunch itself is, uh, is made by a new company that Ben started called Community Products. And uh, the idea behind that is to pay a lot more money to the indigenous tribes in the rainforest to show that the rainforest can be economically viable as living rainforests rather than having to burn them and cut them down and turn them into beef plantations. The demand for Ben and Jerry's ice cream is constantly growing, placing an enormous amount of importance upon the production of their exotic flavors. It's a little bit different um, operation here than in most normal places. I worked for three other ice cream companies before I came here uh, for Kraft Dairy Group for a year making Briars, Seal Test, Light and Lively. Then I worked for um, Dryer Scrand Ice Cream, Oakland, California, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana and each one of those had their own separate little identity. Uh, one was very structured corporate America. Uh, the second one was not so structured, but yet still highly, you know, uh, they were very tight and kept reins on their people, union environment. And then you came here and we're like the corporate antichrist, you know, then we go everything to stay away from being corporate, but yet selling $50 million with ice cream, you can't get away from being corporate, you know, it's tough. The situation that we have here is kind of unique in that, is that now we can't make ice cream any faster. We c it's going as fast as our particular operation can take. Um, one of the constraints that we have is being able to get it cold and frozen, it, which is driven by a liquid ammonia system. We can't go any faster, or as fast as it goes. So the only thing that we can do to pick up more gallons is make it more time. Um, so we know exactly how much we can make uh, every day. And we know we can make approximately 12,000 gallons of pints, 6,000 per side per day. Uh, and one of the approaches that we've had in the last year or so is to try and improve efficiency, to make it better, to make it more efficiently, to have less loss, more first quality, less second quality. And that's the only way, that, you know, that's the way we're going to try and improve our operation. Because the more efficiently you make it, the cheaper it's going to be, and the more money we're going to make, which we, we do like to make money. We do blend our own mix. We mix together the milk and cream, liquid cane sugar, and about eight buckets of egg yolks. And then for a chocolate base, we add in about eight 50-pound bags of Dutch cocoa powder. And we have... Uh, two natural stabilizers to break up any ice crystals. And it only takes about four to six minutes to blend that all together. And then we will pasteurize and homogenize that for extra quality control. And then we let our mix age in our tank room. And that usually ages for at least four to eight hours. It's the same idea as if you let a spaghetti sauce or a chili sauce, you know, kind of sit and simmer on the stove. And then we're ready for our flavorings. Uh, we add a lot of different and kind of unusual things into our flavoring vats. Maybe something like uh, sticky gooey banana puree for our flavor Chunky Monkey. And uh, lots of peanut butter for our flavor Tuskegee Chunk. And one of the more exotic flavors, the White Russian, we add in lots of Kahlua and Kamea liqueurs. Sometimes it jams up and then you'll see, I sit at my desk up there, which is just over the line, and you hear this sort of plop, plop, plop. And what that is, is the ice cream is stopped and they're falling off onto the floor, you know. Ice cream goes everywhere. They have these gray barrels that you saw and they put it into that. And we have the largest hog farmer in Vermont, which we've made an agreement with him. He comes to our plant every day and then picks up these big barrels of waste ice cream. The pigs don't care if it fell on the floor. I mean, the floor is clean, but we put them in there and the, then he picks them up, takes them out there and feeds them to his hogs. We also add some air in, about 20%, and that's why the ice cream is like richer and denser. Jerry likes to say, you know, it makes it chewier. Okay, then we're ready to add our, all of our chunks, and uh, we have fruit feeders that we add those into. Now we have specially modified fillers because those chunks are so large, and uh, so, you know, they work, they work pretty well. They're kind of temperamental. 
to be the most efficient that we can, you try to make on the one of the lines one flavor, all 17 hours, and the other line will make the same flavor. For example, you're here today, we were making New York Super Fudge Chunk since midnight last night, all the way through 5 o'clock. The other line was um, Dastardly Mash from midnight last night to 5 o'clock. That way you get out to stay on the same flavor, get into that a groove that you can really keep, you know, punching it out, and that's the way you make it most efficiently. And that's why we make the most product. We're to the point now where this facility can't, we can't make all of it for the whole company, so we've had to go, um, we built another plant in Springfield, Vermont, um, and we also have an agreement with another ice cream company that produces our product to pick up additional gallons. I'm Ben. I'm Jerry. You can spend your money making long, fancy TV ads, or you can make great ice cream. We went for the ice cream. When Ben and Jerry envisioned their business venture 11 years ago, they wanted to create an enterprise which could allocate its profits in a positive manner. To do this, their company would have to treat all of its employees equally, support campaigns for peace and environmental concerns, and be able to give back to its community, an idea which became a company motto. The idea of the five to one salary ratio, uh, which states that the highest paid people in the company can't make any more than five times what the lowest paid people make, uh, is something that we formally instituted several years ago and the idea behind it is to try to create a feeling among people in the company that we're all working together that it's not uh, you know management versus uh, the employees but it's all of us pulling together and uh, it's really uh, you know sort of a controversial issue at the company uh, not not for any philosophical reason because everybody believes in it but more for a practical reason as to whether or not it works can you really attract and retain the level of people that you need for upper level management the caliber of people and still be paying them uh, you know what is under market rates and uh, you know it's like many things in our company, it's, it's an experiment to see if it works. Uh, and nobody's sure how it's going to turn out, and we may end up changing it. But uh, so far, we're able to hold to it. You know, it's, it's funny because uh, part of what we're trying to do at our company is to, is to show that you don't have to follow all the other rules of business, to show other companies that, yes, you can be financially successful, and still uh, give back to the community and make the world a better place. I personally grew up uh, being afraid of the Russians. Uh, you know, that's what I was taught in school. And, uh, and I accepted the need uh, for the military that we have. Uh, and, and I also felt, uh, you know, completely uh, Powerless that you know even if we didn't need this military there wasn't anything that I could do about it and then uh, I went over there to the Soviet Union and and I realized that uh, these are people who uh, laugh who cry who care about their kids uh, who eat ice cream who love ice cream uh, you know pretty much just like us we make uh, an item called a Peace Pop, which is a chocolate-covered ice cream bar on a stick, and it comes in four fabulous Ben & Jerry's flavors, uh, vanilla, Cherry Garcia, Heath Bar Crunch, and New York Super Fudge Chunk. And uh, the idea behind the Peace Pop is to get across the idea that we live in a really unusual time where we have a unique opportunity to, to achieve world peace. And, uh, Part of the idea of the Peace Pop is to get out the message that we all have a part to play in that, and uh, not only everybody individually, but our company as well. In 1985, the Ben and Jerry's Foundation was established to promote social welfare by sponsoring various charitable organizations. Seven and a half percent of the company's annual earnings are donated to the foundation. You know, I think in terms of the direction of the company, we're trying to really integrate uh, our product mission, which is ice cream, and our economic mission, which is being profitable, along with a social mission. Uh, the social mission being to 
you know, generally make the world a better place to live. And uh, we're trying to take what is our core business, ice cream, and spread that out into into uh, social issues, whether it be opening shops in the Soviet Union to uh, to fund cultural exchanges or to come out with uh, products like Peace Pops, which uh, kind of publicize the need for world peace or whatever. We're we're trying to take our product and and use it not only for making people happy and making money, but to uh, but to push our social mission as well. We haven't really followed traditional business rules, and uh, you know a lot of that is because of Ben. Ben, uh, you know, has been uh, said to have uh, unresolved conflicts with authority. I think that's a nice way to put it. Um, but he really uh, believes that uh, you don't need to be an expert to do things, and you don't need to follow conventional rules because they don't always make sense. And I think there's there's just kind of a fascination. Uh, with two guys like Ben and myself who learned how to make ice cream from a correspondence course and had no uh, business training whatsoever. Uh, you know, just kind of two guys next door who started to make ice cream and uh, all of a sudden had a successful company and uh, it's kind of weird. You know, Ben has said to me many times when somebody tells you that something can't be done, all it means is that it's never been done before. So, you know, I would tell everyone to, uh, you know, to just go ahead and, uh, you know, whether it's in business or anything else, don't feel constrained by traditional thinking or what's always been done before. And, you know, if you're thinking about business, I would say try to find something that you really love doing, something that expresses what you are inside and what your values are rather than something that you just think you can make a bunch of money at. Uh, you know, the, the purpose of business is, is not to make a lot of money. The whole reason that business exists and the economy exists is to serve the needs of people. And that's the way you should approach your business, that you're serving the needs of society and uh, uh, not just out there to take what you can for yourself. The Ben & Jerry's factory tour hosts 23,000 visitors per month during the summertime. The Shelbourne Museum is the only other Vermont attraction which sees more tourists. These visitors leave the Waterbury plant with a better understanding of the company's philosophy and radically different business methods. Ben & Jerry's unique company policies earned them the U.S. Business Persons of the Year Award presented by President Reagan in 1988. Perhaps this prestigious acknowledgement will create a trend of social awareness within the business community.